All right, I'm gonna get it right this time. What are we doing here? Is, is that better? <laughs> but anyway, my name is Ed and this is the Rot Gut Review follow-up video to the Tiger Thick Review I put out earlier in the week. Go watch that here if you haven't seen it already. Now, I don't commonly do follow-up videos for reviews, but the response to that video was <laughs> so massive and uh, there were so many things people wanted to know about and talk about that it definitely, definitely needed a follow-up. But seriously, when I made that video, I had no idea how passionate Brendan Schaub's um, fans are. As of this filming, that video has nearly 9,000 views and we've gained like almost 600 subscribers. Thank you to everyone who watched, commented. Thank you especially to everyone who's a new subscriber. That's awesome. And a special thanks to the folks at the Fighter and the Kid subreddit for sharing the video and helping me understand what all of you were talking about in the comments. I mean, I get some of it now, but I would still say like 90% of those comments, I have no idea what you're talking about. Anyhow, let's talk a little bit more about Tiger Thick because there were a few things that people brought up that I definitely thought needed addressing. Number one being the price. When I did my review, I did not know what this was retailing for. Turns out it's $80. Whoa. In my review, I said I'd pay maybe 20 for it because it is interesting, it is unique, but there are some pretty serious flaws that I thought made it not worth much more than that. A few people were a little bit surprised at that price point, you know, kind of assuming that, you know, $20, all you're gonna get is really cheap, crappy bourbon in a plastic jug. That's not really true though. I think there are a lot of things in the $15 to $30 range that people overlook because they think everything has to be so premium these days. Everything has to be a luxury brand, which is, the direction the spirits industry is going. More and more people are buying more expensive bottles, but fewer of them. However, there are things like Wild Turkey, Ezra Brooks, Old Overholt, uh, McConnell's Blended Irish Whiskey, even some of the, you know, somewhat lower end blended scotches like Famous Grouse. They're all solid products. They may not be ambitious products. They're not there to blow your socks off, but they're solid, they're consistent. But that's the difference. This is more of an ambitious product. They're trying to blend, you know, bourbon, an American whiskey with Japanese whiskey, make something new, make something someone hasn't really done before. The problem is the execution. They didn't really execute very well. It didn't turn out how I would have hoped and I don't know, maybe they love it, but I don't think most people will think this is the epitome of what it could have been. But that said, I do appreciate people who are trying to experiment and do different things with whiskey and, and you know, try all sorts of new stuff. You do have to still make a good product though, and this one, there were some failings, which is why I definitely can't recommend anybody buy this at that $80 price tag. There's no way. Now, I know a lot of people in the comments seem to have a very dim opinion of Brendan Schaub, and whether or not that's rightfully deserved, I don't know. I don't have anything against the guy. I still have tried not to find out anything about the guy so I can stay neutral. However, I would like to believe that they're going to try again and they will make something better if given the opportunity. I would hope. And hope you know, springs eternal, right? You gotta hope that people will try again to make something better. If this is just a pure cash grab and they're just trying to rush this out and get people to buy it as quickly as possible, make a buck, that would be unfortunate. That would be really sad. Because I think there's potential here. I really do. Obviously, this is batch one. And if there is a batch two or batch three, I would really hope that, you know, they might change up the formula a little bit and try to make something really cool. Because cross-country blends are really neat when someone does something like take Irish and Scotch and Japanese or whatever and mix it all together. That's fun. That's exciting. And I wish people would do more of it. 
but you do have to start with good product in the first place. And part of the issue I wonder here is if the partner he's with, Ico Importers, they're not usually known for their quality. They're not usually known for making the most high-end products. And it kind of shows here. Now I've heard from people that they were originally gonna sell this at a lower price point, somewhere around 40, 50. That would be a little bit more reasonable. Uh, although it's still, I would buy it just for the uniqueness aspect, not necessarily because it's a really awesome whiskey. So 40 or 50, that's still pretty heavy. What I would imagine is that they're probably trying to take advantage of Brendan Schaub's notoriety, first of all, because he is famous and you know, celebrity whiskeys are always marked up a little bit, or a lot of bit, depending, be just because they've got a famous name behind them and they figure they can sell some based on their reputation. But there's also the element of what's called in whiskey circles, the kanji tax. We call it the kanji tax because anytime you see a bottle with some kanji on it, you know you're gonna pay a premium just because it's associated with Japan. Now that's because Japanese whiskey has gotten crazy, crazy hot recently. Mostly because of the work of two companies, Suntory and Nika. In the last decade, Japanese whiskey has gone from known, but not super sought after, to one of the mega stars of the whiskey craze. Japanese whiskey prices have skyrocketed in the last few years. It's been ridiculous how much demand has gone up. And I'm sure Brennan Schaub and his associates are thinking they can put the price up a little bit because of how in demand Japanese whiskey is overall. And they're probably right. But there's another thing about kanji that I'll be talking about later in the video. That brings me to another question that some people had, which is, is this just re-bottled sensei whiskey? Sensei whiskey is another Ico product. It's made out of Japanese malt and then a foreign grain whiskey that they don't tell us where the hell it came from. That's possible because it's legal under Japanese law for Japanese producers to import someone else's whiskey, put it in a bottle, and call it Japanese. Which is frankly ridiculous and unscrupulous in my opinion. And the Japanese Spirits and Liqueurs Makers Association has set up a standard to reduce that and make people actually make Japanese whiskey. However, not everyone has signed on to it, and even if they do, the government's not enforcing it. So it's still entirely possible for Ico to keep making their weird, unscrupulous whiskey. However, in the case of Tiger Thick, this is not just rebottled sensei, because there is a bourbon component. Bourbon is a whiskey that has to be made in America from corn. So the bourbon component of this comes from Midwest grain products. They are a massive industrial sized distiller in Indiana. Now the Japanese portion of this, being that it's partially grain whiskey and partially malt whiskey, there's a good chance that that is some of the same stuff they put in Sensei, which is not good stuff to start with, I gotta say. MGP, I love MGP. I think MGP makes fantastic products. If they were just sourcing from MGP, this might have been a lot better. It wouldn't have had the more interesting Japanese elements, but might have been more solid. But considering this is Ico, they may have started with some sketchy grain whiskey that they brought into Japan. Just as a quick aside for those who may not know, malt whiskey is made all out of malted barley in a pot still whereas grain whiskey is made out of pretty much anything else in a column still. There's more rules to it than that, but that's a basic outline. So yes, the blend in the Japanese whiskey could be the same as sensei, Japanese malt plus foreign grain. Then they blended that with bourbon and re-imported it into the United States. Now, after they imported it again, they have to find someone to distribute it for them. And apparently, according to D-X, they're having a little trouble doing that. I was wondering about that, because it's not actually out yet, but it does say 2021 edition. So we don't have much time left in 2021. <laughs> I don't know how they're gonna get that out. I guess the issue being is that they came up with the idea, they put the whiskey together, without figuring out who they were gonna distribute through. 
In America, if you're a whiskey producer or importer, you can't just sell it straight to the customer. Most states have a three-tier system, which means you have producers, distributors, retailers. Producers sell to distributors, distributors sell to retailers, retailers sell to the consumer. So apparently Mr. Schaub didn't realize that, thought he could sell it himself, and now he's in a pickle where he's got many, many cases and no one to move them for him. Honestly, I feel bad for the guy because, yes, he should have figured that out ahead of time and, and gotten in touch with the distributor and negotiated all this out long before he had stock. However, this, the three-tier system is so, so stupid. I have worked in liquor distribution and in retail, so I've made my living off the system. But, um... God, it is so, so stupid. It really is a holdover from Prohibition. It's These are very archaic laws that really have no place in the modern world. So I feel I feel bad for Brendan Chubb. I do, I do. That's That sucks. Especially now that we're coming to the end of the year. He's sitting on all these cases. And depending on what legal jurisdiction he's housing them in, he might have to pay a lot of tax on that unsold product. Or maybe Ico importers will. I don't know the situation they have set up there. Now, a few people brought up the label, especially uh, Castutus Castutitis. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, but they were wondering what I thought of the label, what I thought of the name, and how well I thought this would sell, what kind of demographic it would attract. Well, I guess the first thing is, I understand Brendan Schaub has a son named Tiger. So if he named the whiskey after his boy, I think that's actually very sweet. You know, naming it after his wee baby, that's, that's sweet. I like that. I like that. As for the thick part, you know, it's a little funny that, you know, you know putting it on a whiskey bottle. Because, uh, you know, most, most times whiskey labels stick to some very traditional images. Which, honestly, I don't really like. I really think whiskey needs to loosen up a little bit and be a little bit less self-serious, especially about the names and the labels and the image it projects. Because Irish and Scotch whiskey usually stick to kind of this old Gaelic kind of thing and rye and bourbon, they are usually kind of the old boy, southern old timey kind of thing. And I think whiskey could probably take a leaf from craft beer, right? Craft beer, you've got all these cutesy little labels, you've got cartoon characters all over your stuff, you've got punny names, you know, they're having fun with it, right? And I think whiskey could do well to lighten up and have some fun with that sort of thing. So I don't really have a problem with the name Tiger Thick. Uh, I've seen some much dumber names on some flavored whiskeys. Don't even get me started about flavored whiskey. That's a whole nother can of worms. It might not appeal to some of the older, more self-serious whiskey drinkers, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. As for the label itself, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not a advertising guy. It is a little busy, I guess, especially since most whiskeys these days are going towards a more minimalist kind of look, but yeah. It's all right, it's all right. It's not something I feel like I'm in a place to judge. I don't really care too much about labels. I understand they're important because, you know, for someone who's just walking into a liquor store, a label is the most direct advertising you have, you know? A catchy label makes someone look at the bottle and be like, ooh, what's that? For me, I worry a lot less about that because usually I'm more attracted to knowing what's in the bottle, what's going on in there, what did they do different, and what's interesting. Now there's another thing about the label that I alluded to earlier, and uh, that's the kanji. Now, apparently, and I didn't know this, I don't know Japanese, I don't speak it, none of that, but apparently, according to a couple folk, uh, there's a little bit of a misspelling with the kanji on here. Thank you to Noodle here on YouTube and Thurman Merman over on Reddit for pointing this out. It's actually on the little fake tax stamp that they put on the top. It, these kanji here are supposed to say whiskey. And when you write that vertically, the final character is supposed to be a vertical line. They have it as horizontal. Which, does it ruin the whiskey? Does it ruin the label? No, no, I don't think so. I am surprised they didn't catch that though. I am surprised they didn't catch it. 
considering, you know, they're working with Japanese people, you think someone would have figured that out. Now, I do understand the label has won an award from Muse, which is an advertising award. I'm really not familiar with that whatsoever. I don't, I don't know what the criteria are for those awards or anything like that. There were a lot of questions about that award in the comments. I don't feel competent enough to comment on those awards. Suffice to say, apparently there's rewards for labels. And another question I got more than a couple times was, uh, which is better, Proper 12 from Conor McGregor or Tiger Thick from Brendan Schaub? I'd rather drink the Tiger Thick. I'm a level with you, because uh, I really don't like Proper 12. And also, I really don't like Conor McGregor now that I think about it. But this has been the follow-up video to my Tiger Thick review. If you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to leave them down below, and I'll address them as best I can. And once again, thank you all so much for the views and subscribing and liking the video. Man, you guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to celebrate 3,000 subscribers this weekend on our live stream. So until next time, make sure to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay rotten.